Hey party people and welcome back to MVM. Today I'm here with a review of Merchant's Cove. This is a game for a one of four players, plays in about 90 to 120. Although it says 60 to 90, whew, I don't know about that. But anyway, in this game, you're gonna be playing these merchants. You're gonna be creating different uh, things on your board. This is an asymmetrical game. It's an asymmetrical Euro game, medium complexity. You're gonna be, be creating items on your board. Uh, you'll be trying to sell these to the meeples that come into town. Now the meeples represent a market of different color adventurers. Uh, they come up on these docks and you're trying to sell large and small items to them for scoring multipliers. And then you also have a sponsorship that characters or uh, players are gonna get uh, for having certain things unlocked on their board and also having townsfolk that uh, create multipliers as well for the end game, uh, end game. Final Frontier Games sent this to me. They sent all the extras and stuff like that from the Kickstarter. So I won't be touching on that too much. I wanna tell you about the base game only. And just because they sent it to me does not mean that they do not get a fair review. Nobody's safe here, party people. Let's go ahead and take a look at this on the table. All right, party people, let's dig into the main board here. And I'm gonna show you what happens over the course of three rounds, and then we'll cycle around in different characters so you get an idea of how they work. All right, this game is played over three rounds. And in this, each round, you're gonna have an arrival phase where the adventurers arrive, and then you'll have uh, the production phase where you'll take actions uh, using this wheel, spending time, and then you'll have the marketing phase where you're selling and getting your sponsors. Uh, so what does the arrival phase look like? Each round, you'll start with two of these adventurers in each boat. You'll be drawn from this bag. You have the yellow and the blue, which are rarest, and then you have the green and red, which are uh, more abundant. Uh, the yellow and blues are going to cost like, they're going to give you eights, and then uh, the orange, I mean, I'm sorry, the red and greens are going to give you six for the larger items. Kind of the same thing, three, four for the small ones. Uh, so you have those, and that's going to determine your market, basically. There's two sides on here. Uh, these can go to this dock right here, and these can go to these docks right here. Uh, so what are you doing in the production phase? This is where people will take in actions on their boards. Actions cost time. Uh, so they'll be, doing, they'll be moving their characters around, making sure they take an action. When they take those said actions, they're going to cost one or two times, sometimes zero. Uh, but then they're going to move on the action wheel. All right, and when they do that, if they're further ahead, they have to wait until the person that's furthest back goes. So the person that's furthest back will always go. And sometimes that can lead to the person being on the top who's behind being able to go again. So they may go uh, one time like that. Once they pass this little spot here with these adventure spaces on there, boom, they get to draw another person in from the back. Now what happens is, is now they get to decide what they want to do with that character. And this will change the market up. Maybe they want to add to the same color so that they, they have items that they want to sell that match that color. Uh, maybe they want to manipulate and know that another character has red. They don't want red to be as exciting, so they put it over there. They're also paying attention to what size items are going to be sold there. So it's kind of, you know, a little bit of, that's the interaction of the game. Uh, so what they'll do is they'll keep taking these actions until boats start to fill up and they get to choose where they want to put them. Uh, so they'll put them on the docks and then if one is left over, uh, they will, when one is left over, they will put the rest into these sponsorship area halls. And I'll talk about what that means. But like I said, once again, they'll start putting these actions in here like so. And the third one that's left out will go here. And the rest will dock like that. It will dock. And when four of these come in, I'm just going to take these out, sorry. All right. So when these four come in, all of a sudden we will have, let's say we got this like this. And now this will move back. And now we just start taking actions until someone goes over. And then they go over, let's say like that, something like that. The round, that part of the round will end. And now we move over to the marking phase. But before we get to that, I just want to talk about one action that happens, uh, at some actions that happen around the board. Now, when I pull these out, there's, there are rogues in there. The rogues are negative experiences, and they do have different rules based on these cards. These cards uh, will determine when they are pulled from the bag, how many are out here and how many are inside this bag. And they have different rules, like the rogues don't go into the ships. The rogues can be, if you, wanted, if you take a, uh, 
but one of these cards here, the corruption cards, then you can change it to a different color. Um, they alter how they, uh, they move people around in the boats. And if you have a sec the Secret Stash expansion, they have so many, uh, so many of those. We're going to talk about this corruption a little bit later. But these Townsfolk cards are one of the, the actions that every, every character has. They can recruit Townsfolks. That's one of the things everybody has been able to do. They can recruit Townsfolks and they can also activate their boards. But when you take a Townsfolk action, you just take one of these cards, you pay the cost in time, and you gain Corruption cards. But they give you a benefit and they also give you a multiplier for these sponsorships out here. But what they do is they go inside of this board and every character has a version of this board. Uh, for themselves. It helps them do specific actions on their board, but it also may just get rid of these corruption cards. If you can't tell, corruption cards are bad. Uh, but they have different versions of their actions or different transfers of their actions and things like that to kind of mix up uh, some for the deficiencies maybe in your game or just to make rounds more efficient. And you can have four of these up in there, but you're going to receive the reward that's on them already. So you're going to receive those awards and those abilities, but then you're also going to receive these icons as multipliers for sponsorships at the end of the game. Uh, so that's just what's going on there. But now we're going to sell to the market. All right, so the ships are in. We got the ships are in, and we have our items everywhere. And what players are going to do is sell to either the large item market, the small item market, and the large and small. And they're going to be able to sell to all of them. I'm sorry. Uh, they're going to be able to sell to all of them. So I can sell a large to the green and blue. And everybody can do that. Okay, so if I were to sell this blue to this character right here, to this guy, to the blue market, I would only get eight points. It's eight times one. Well, let's say we get to this part right here, and everybody can choose that. Let's say I get to this part right here. I have a, a, a yellow four. It is four times one, two, three. So that would get 12 for that. So I get 12 gold for that. And then finally, if I wanted to wait, I could sell a whole bunch of stuff to this market right here, large and small. But the problem is here, if I do sell there, I also receive a corruption card. So let's just talk about corruption cards. Corruption cards are negative things. They are negative multipliers. And what happens is, is at the end of the game, you will multiply how many of these faces you have on cards times how many of these guys, these rogue guys are here. And that's the thing. These cards change the board game state and they change how those rogues work, but you can have a whole bunch stack up here. And they can be on these boats and then they come into town and they get, keep getting added to this spot. So you definitely want to keep those down. And even some of the townsfolk give you those. So you got to watch out for those and find ways to get rid of them. One of those spots on there gets rid of them. So there you go. So you sell to those guys, you sell it to everybody out there, but then you also have these things called sponsorships. Now during the game, you're going to receive those if you uncover the chevrons that matches these during the game. You'll get uh, as many as there are. So this will be worth three points, two points, two points, one point. So this character would get all of them over here. The chronomancer will get all of them. At the end of the game, you will be looking at the icons on your townsfolk cards and you'll be multiplying times that. So it would be two times this, two times uh, two, which is four. And this would be three times one, two, which is six, two times one, which is uh, two. So there you go. It's, it's really, really simple stuff. You got your townsfolk stuff. You got your, these cards you're trying to get rid of. And that's basically the end of the game. I should have mentioned this too, by the way. Um, rounds do change. You get to the other rounds, you're going to unlock a little bit more of the board. So at one round, you may unlock this, you get a little mouse, and it gives you the option to be able to go into this little cut right here. And then the next round, you'll be able to go into both cuts. So you kind of have like a little way to kind of navigate and extend some turns and things like that. But that's pretty much it. Uh, everything going on in the main board. Let's slide over to each one of these and show you how they work. So this is the Chronomancer and Assistant. It's my favorite character or characters in the game. Uh, what you're doing on your turn is, is you're moving your Assistant ahead of your Chronomancer. You can't pass them up. He can only be behind them. And when you land on spots uh, on your turn, you will take that action. And this is the thing. It's very easy to get items with the Chronomancer at the cost of a lot of time. A lot of your actions are only going to cost two time, if not more, based on what you take. It's not uh, as easy to deal with things, but it's easy to get items. Well, there's a way you reduce that. Now, I just want you to see, I mean, I can get items galore on my way there. We're just taking two time. Now, I've spent four time by taking that action. That's tough. It's a lot. Actually, I've spent 
uh, two time total by what well, Morris game state, but I picked up I picked up two of the corruption cards. That's not good. Okay, <laughs> that's not good at all. But I do have items. Awesome. Uh, but the thing is, is once they get to the end and they have to meet up at this board here, a couple things happen. When, when the assistant gets here, they will freeze time and take these tokens off to make their actions cost less. So you can actually spend these to make the op options cheaper, and then also you get some sponsorship opportunity there at the, uh, during the marketing phase. This guy here, the actual Chronomancer, changes the board game state by sliding in one of these tiles that you can choose from. Whoops. You can choose from, and boom, it comes out. And the side flips over. If you get the blue ones in there, it's a lot easier to take actions and they cost less time. Then you can actually use these freeze time tokens to make things cost zero. But that's the fun puzzle of this character. Let's keep moving on to the other ones. I don't want to stick with these things for too long. All right, next up is the blacksmith. And the blacksmith is all about dice placement. Let's see. So we're rolling down the dice here, and we're going to be adding them to specific spots to um, hit requirements. Uh, most of them are going to be below. Half is going to be below. Half is going to be above. So I want to take lower numbers, and take, I'm going to take my guy from here, and place them on there to put, put them in this little, um, in the furnaces here. And then let's say I want to do, for this one here, for one time, I would definitely want to put higher numbers in here. And the number that's at the top, you will make that color. Um, and then you'll just kind of move these around, taking one time at each time, or putting them down here in this smelting machine. So what eventually what you do is, is you're going to forge this stuff, all of this stuff. So I, I would make a red, a small blue. I don't have the small blue out here. And then I also could burn this up here in the smelter, and then I'd be able to take one of these dice out. Now all these dice come back, and as you can tell, we just added another die to our die pool, and we roll it again, and we start all over. And then we also open up a sponsorship by doing that. It's a very straightforward character. Almost too straightforward for me. Uh, this is an onboarding type character. Literally the first one you probably should play if you're hesitant to play asymmetrical game. But that's the problem with me. It, it's almost too straightforward to the point where I didn't feel like there was interesting decisions. Uh, the decisions were very, very straightforward. That's not a bad thing, just not for me. Let's get to the next one. So here is your alchemist. Now the alchemist is sort of potion explosion-ish, uh, gizmo, something like that, um, if you're familiar with that. And it's only because you're picking marble. So you'll be taking your turns. There's three, uh, three rows in this marble thing here, and you're going to be picking one. And in that row, you're going to be picking a color. So then you pick the color, and you pick the marbles out of that color. And any ones that match that, that come down like that, okay? And then boom, you take those, you start putting them in your little areas there, and you can mix it up however you want to do it. And then based on color combinations that you have, when it comes time to stir those pots, you can make potions, uh, potions that you can sell. So for example, I have a whole bunch of green here. I have two green and any other color, so now I can make a big green. Uh, I have three of anything, and I can take those off and make one of these inker things like that. And this puts this black in here. You don't want to have a whole bunch of that inker in there. You put it in there, and let's see, I want to do... Uh, let's see, I'll just do two small. So I'll do the two and then make a small like that. And now that's all I do. Uh, this is a very easy character to get into. Uh, it's one of the introductory characters, although I do not like it that much. Uh, it's not my favorite one, simply because I've played games like this before, and I want a little bit more interesting choices to do. It's not a bad character, of course, particularly, but it is one of the good beginner starter characters to teach someone how the game plays. Let's keep it moving. All right, party people, we are winding down here, and this is the last character we're going to talk about in the base game, and that is the captain. This is my second favorite character uh, in the main box. So what happens in this, in this guy? They have four different boats that are around the area here. They start out in the middle island, and what you're doing is you're trying to move them around, mostly by using this action. You're going to be flicking it, and then wherever you flick it, it's going to divide the movement amongst your ships, okay? So you'll divide your movement amongst the ships, and if you ever end out on the outside like that, you'll unveil these. So you don't necessarily know. There's a stack of the big ones in here, and this represents your large, these are your large ones here. So now we know we got the rare, we got two of the rarest out here and the red out there. So we definitely want to keep that. And by the way, you got your sponsorships for the marketing phases if you stay out there. Uh, but the big issue is, is now we're going to start adding these cursed coins. And what these do is they stack up based on the actions that you take. And you have to decide um, how risky you want to get with this. If you do go to this spot, 
and you happen to have a ship there, it will reduce the, the chips or the coins, one, two, three, four, and it will also give you points for taking those away. But if it ever gets to seven, then you're going to get a corruption card and you do not want these to stack up. So the whole idea is, is to get to the spots you need to get to and eventually what will happen is, is when you get to this action right here, you're going to be able to lift these out. Okay, You want to be able to lift these out and those will get added to your supply. You also have a spot where you can go fishing, so you would go fishing right here and you can get the smaller items uh, as well, so you get those small items. Here's the kicker, when you get all this stuff, you gotta go back, they put you back in the middle. So you have a little bit of a timing to this stuff when you take these actions and you get the benefits, but it's just a fun little timing thing that's going on and movement, puzzle, I like that. And I forgot to mention that you also get, um, you get curse coins for going diagonal so you can take shortcuts. That's pretty much the character in a nutshell. Let's go ahead and get back to the table and then we'll get back to our final thoughts. All right, party people, final thoughts here on the Merchant's Cove. Yeah, this one's a little complicated. I didn't necessarily like it too much. I'll tell you why. Uh, well, we start with the characters. I told you kind of why I didn't like each one a little bit here. Blacksmith a little too straightforward, and you're making items and you don't necessarily know if you're going to be able to sell them. It's one of those characters that's so one lane that you're kind of exposed as to what you're trying to do. And the same thing goes for the alchemist, except for you may get not even get enough balls to do what you want to do or marbles to do what you want to do. And uh, you're sitting here looking at a round where you don't have anything that you can sell. I've seen it happen before. I've seen it happen several times and it just doesn't feel fun. Uh, you're going to say get good, and I'm going to tell you sometimes the marbles don't fall how they should. That's what I'm going to tell you. Uh, and also, these row cards, just overall the content is not really all the content. There's a secret stash box that has so much content in it that it almost feels like they left out a good chunk for a person who's buying it at the store. Like there's so many more row cards that give you so many more interesting things to do with them almost feel like I had a loss. Townsfolk cards that change from these kind of generic actions to way more fun actions that you get as benefits and icons and different, like it makes, your, makes the choices heavier for you. And I, I just thought that was, it just feels like a miss. It's, I feel like, not that they're hiding something, it just felt like, man, like I had that and now I get to see what people were missing out on if they just bought the base box. So that might be something you want to think about. And overall, the higher player count makes this market super swinging. You're going to have so many people manipulating that bag. They're going to be looking at what you're doing and whatever, and they're going to be looking at what they need to do, and it may not work out for them. So you may have this round where not many people are selling anything. It just doesn't feel as good. I, It's just one of those things about this game that I'm not necessarily sure about. The, the interaction that is going on just didn't feel as interesting. And I'm going to leave that right there. Positive stuff. Uh, I really do like these two characters. I like the characters out of the base box even more than, for the most part, the ones that are in here. Uh, but I do, I just enjoyed those both those characters. One's super risky, the type of risky that I like. The other one has interesting decisions that changes the board game state. That's what I like. That kind of stuff, like there. I also like what the rogue cards can do, but I'm kind of peppering it into stuff that's in the secret stash, not necessarily in here. Uh, I like the time wheel in there, the little time wheel action system. That's always fun in different games. Uh, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but I do like those type of actions where the further you are behind, you get to go first and stuff like that, because it makes you kind of make the best thinky, thinky choices. Oh, I said thinky, oh my Lord. <laughs> that's a review word I can't stand. Uh, but yeah, I, it, it does make you, it help you make these really kind of interesting choices. And that's probably why I like the Colonel Mancer so much, because you can reduce the time that it takes for him to make those choices. Uh, but that's really it for the most part that I liked uh, about this game. There's a lot to be left desired, unfortunately, and that leads to me giving this game a 6. Now, if you're one of those people who love solo games, this will probably be a lot higher to you. In fact, it, it would probably make it an 8 for you. And, uh, you know, and I, for me, if I don't like half the characters, that keeps the score lower. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay with the 6 here. Really, really a uh, lot of great ideas, but ultimately it just the design did not connect with me. And maybe it connected with you. Let me know in the comments below uh, how you feel about this game. How did you feel about this review? Good, bad, or ugly? I'm fine with that. We're up for conversation. Uh, and I'd like to thank Final Frontier Games for sending me a copy of this game. Uh, and uh, hopefully we have a better game next time, for, but this one didn't work for me. You guys take care. You have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for joining me on MVM.